Welcome to the Elfry podcast and uh, today I'm sitting here with Katarina and uh, she has this great company I've seen like a couple of weeks ago or months ago popping up everywhere. I would call it sleep company, you know, you have like pajamas and stuff like that. You will go more in depth. We'll talk about you. We'll talk about how you started the company, your CEO and co-founder. And I'm butchering the name for sure, but it's Dux Majan, right? Very good, oh, very good. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you guys are a huge company in the meantime. You started like 2016. You are doing a lot of B2C sales, but you're growing in B2B. Yeah. I read in over 100 countries, you, we need to dig into that more, how, how you guys did that. You won like every prize. Uh, I'm very uh, jealous about that because we never won the SEF prize. We were like second and you were entrepreneur of the year and you got so many prices, but not only prices, but you got also sales. And I want to learn more about it because it's like a field that probably most people don't know too much about, pajamas. So um, before we start, when we talk about pajamas, what can people do who don't wear pajamas to improve their sleep? I mean, there's so many different things we can do holistically to improve our sleep. Uh, everything from what we're eating, uh, how we're exercising, when we're exercising, turning off our computers and el electronic devices, our habits, lifestyle. So there is, you know, a huge range of things we can do. But we focus on the sleeper was closest to our skin and how this really helps us sleep yeah. better. Uh, focusing a lot actually on temperature regulation because yeah. temperature is incredibly important for our sleep quality. Yeah, that's what I, I read. I'm, I'm like a, a life hacker and trying to optimize my life all the time. And number one thing is sleep. So everybody's like uh, really into sleep nowadays. What I read is that the sleep, you're waking up because your body temperature is rising, right? And you're falling asleep because your body temperature is decreasing. Is that right? Yes, to fall asleep, our, bo our core uh, body temperature needs to drop. At the same time, actually, our skin temperature increases. Oh, okay. So that's a little bit of interesting as yeah. a phenomenon. So if we are too hot, we will struggle to fall yeah. asleep. And Everybody knows that feeling, right? Yes. And if we're getting hot during the night, our sleep quality, we might wake up. Or if we sleep through, we don't have the deep sleep phases. We yeah. need to really fully recover. Yeah. So before we get into sleep afterwards uh, i want to dig into that a bit more afterwards because it's i think it's the basis for for a healthy lifestyle i want to learn a little bit more about you so can you tell a little bit about your background and before you started the company what did you do so i'm originally from sweden i grew up in the south of sweden in a very very small uh, town actually i went abroad for the first time when i was 19 uh, at that time in Sweden, it was impossible to get a, like a, a job, really, if you were underage, minor. Yeah. So I worked at the local farm picking uh, raspberries, actually. Really? <laughs> Earned enough for a return ticket. And I went with a friend to London. We put yeah. our bags in Victoria Station and started yeah. to look for a job. And then I stayed there for six months. It was super interesting, but I learned also that I think I really need an education to be able to do something I'm really, really passionate yeah. about. So I went back to Sweden. I completed my master's at the Lund University. Uh, I studied there. I did my master in strategic management and economic analysis, actually. Mm -hmm. But I also studied languages. So I also studied English and actually mm -hmm. also a bit of German, even though I try to avoid speaking German. <laughs> we won't speak German <laughs> at all today. And then I was offered a job at an international company focusing on cosmetics and wellness, actually. Yeah. So I started there in Sweden. It was a Swedish company. And then I was moved to their head office in, in Brussels. So I lived there four and a half years. Then I went back to Sweden for um, because they moved the head office, actually. Yeah. Then I moved with the company to Asia. And then I was running, actually, quite a big team of 45 people. Where did you live in Asia? In Bangkok. In Bangkok. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful city. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, it's absolutely crazy. Yeah, I've been yeah. there like three months ago. A friend of mine has a business there. and It's just madness. It is, but it's, it's such a lovely madness. Yeah, and yeah. I think you can then also get away. I remember going there. I was like, oh, God, this city is really insane. But then you go on a rooftop and yeah. all of a sudden there's just silence and you and see, the, yeah. you see the, the, sun, yeah. the sun and everything. Yeah. And it's so nice on these roof, in these rooftop bars. Yeah. It's really wonderful. How long did you stay in, in uh, Bangkok? I was there for about two and a half years. Yeah. yeah. So I was working regionally because yeah. they had the, the regional head office in Bangkok. It was kind of in between our core markets, mm -hmm. which was China, India, and Indonesia. So yeah. actually Thailand itself was a very, very small market, uh, but it was well-placed uh, geographically. Yeah. 
So I was heading, I was a, a regional marketing director for yeah. the for the company there. Yeah. And then what brought you to Switzerland? You know, how did that work out? Yes. So then I actually, uh, I decided to quit my job when I was in Asia because I wanted to make a shift in my career. And I had a six months notice. So I was like, okay. I've, and I And I started directly from university working. I never had even like a two week holiday. Yeah. I was constantly working. So I said, okay, I want to take a time out to think about what I want to do. Yeah. So I took uh, some some time off and then um, decided to go back to Sweden or to Europe. And then I started to really reflect on where I want to go with yeah. my life. And that kind of brought me strangely enough to Paris, which I was for four months as a consultancy edge engagement. Yeah. And when I was in Paris, uh, I was offered a job for a Swedish company in Switzerland. Yeah. And that's how I came to Switzerland, actually. And at first, it was kind of funny because I thought that the the job was based in Lausanne, yeah. but it was Lucerne. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you prepared your French in Paris. Exactly. You were like, I'm ready. I'm ready with my French getting into Lucerne. Like, okay. <laughs> so it was it was slightly before I moved that I realized that it was the wrong city, but... Uh, then I so I did something completely different. I was working for EF, which is the yeah, l- world's uh, uh, largest provider of private yeah. education. I worked for their business school division. When I was working there, I was offered a, a position then to move to London. I didn't want to move again. And yeah. me and my partner that I met at that time, we were already talking a lot about the dreams we have had individually of starting. Is a business. he Swiss? He is Swiss. He's yes. Swiss. So yeah. you met him along the way. Yes. Yeah. Then came kind of the opportunity to really dig into that. So we started to approach it in quite an analytical way, thinking about both our what are the kind of mega trends and what are we passionate about. Mm-hmm. And that came to the intersection actually of sleep, health and wellness. Yeah. And really the emergence of the understanding of how important sleep is for overall health and well-being and really all facets of our yeah. lives. Something I discovered myself as well, we're living in particular living in Asia actually, because I was traveling so much. Yeah. Between jet Asia, all yeah, the time. I was constantly jet lagged, and when you're always tired, it really, really impacts your life yeah. quite negatively. And then we started; to, we were both doing quite a lot of sports. So we started to think how strange it is that in sports, where there has been so much happening in terms yeah. of understanding fiber technology and and construction techniques and how that impacts performance and comfort, but nothing happened in sleep. Yeah. We spend a third of our lives sleeping, but we spend that time in one of the least innovative uh, items around traditional pajamas. Mm-hmm. So we had the idea to reinvent sleepwear and yeah. to really look at how we could have a functionally optimized sleepwear. Just very short. Was there like a role model for that or was there like nothing at this time when you had this idea? You know, was there like another company doing something similar, like the large brands we know, like the Kalidas of this world? Were they also into sleep tech or was that like nobody talked about that at the point when you started? I would say our inspiration came more from there are sportswear companies yeah. that really introduced wearables it. Wearables and stuff yes. like that. But also like trackers and in, also even the mattress, you know, yeah. people are really start to think about sleep in a different way. So what we could see is that in so many areas where we were starting to optimize our sleep environment, but we didn't think about the clothes. Mm-hmm. So people could spend 10, 15,000 on a bed, but sleep in like a cotton pajama, for example, and that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Or you're tracking your sleep, but you're not, doing something that you easily could do to optimize your yeah. sleep, then what's the point? Yeah. Um, so that was really our inspiration. The big players like, uh, you know, Kalida and, and um, May and Simula and so forth, they they really focus more on apparel. So yeah. it's the underwear, it's the swimwear, and then kind of nightwear more as clothing, but not really from a, how it actually supports our sleep. Yeah. I have a lot of friends who bought now like this uh, eight sleep and stuff like that to cool down their mattresses. And we will talk about that afterwards. So let's dig into your brand. Uh, first of all, I saw you guys on Instagram. Suddenly my whole Instagram was full with your with your ads. And I was like, oh, that's a cool brand. And then I, I Googled you guys and I saw, oh, it's a Swiss brand. It's not even an international brand, but it looked like really international from 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 day one. And then I'm living in Seefeld and I walked by Seefeld and suddenly I saw, oh, these guys are here as well. And then I was like, oh, oh my God, I need to check that out, what it is. And then the first thing, what I realized is nobody probably can pronounce that name. So can you pronounce it properly once that like everybody gets it? And I heard or I read that it's like power and, and day, right? So it's like yeah. the, the, the getting up and waking mm. up. How do you pronounce it? Daxmeam. Daxmeam. 
it's, uh, it, if people think it's more complicated yes. to pronounce than it is, it's so difficult to find a name that really fits. And we yeah. have been asked many times, like, why this name? It has a meaning, like I said, yeah. it's a Swedish word that, that refers yeah. to day and power. And for us to sleep better is to live better. It's yeah. not necessarily the time we spend in bed. It's yeah. the time we spend outside of bed, yeah. the energy we have, how yeah. it impacts our health, our well-being. Uh, so that was our inspiration. If we start with the name, you know, you you explained how you came up with the idea. But I, I believe when I was looking at it, there's like so much value to that name because every time I look at it, I wonder how do I pronounce it? I look at it every time. I try to read it every time. And was that a strategic move or was that just coincidence that you guys were like, okay, we're taking this power day. It's Swedish. I'm Swedish. Let's put it up. Or was it like a strategic approach where you guys were like, let's take a complicated name and start with a brand or for people around, they don't know how to pronounce it. And just being a topic of talking about it all the time. Was it like a strategic marketing idea? It was something we consider. It was more of a negative than a positive, we we felt. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, when you look for a name, for us, it was we knew we were going to be a digital business. So we needed to have a dot com domain available, which is super tr difficult to find, actually. Yeah, um, it's awful. It's yes, awful. There are this, all these domain yeah, buyers and yeah. it's it's so... What Was it free? Yes, yeah. it was free. So yeah. we had it. So we have daxman.com, .co.uk, .ch, .ee, .fr, .se. I yeah. mean, we have all the variants. Yeah. Uh, so that was one factor. Do you need all of them or are you just doing everything through .com? Uh, we we use all of them. Actually, we at the moment have separate websites yeah. as well. There's more of a technical reasons behind yeah. it. But otherwise, um, some of those domain domains are just like redirecting to, yeah. to a main domain. Yeah. But I still think it can also make a difference in just showing that we are yeah. available on a local yeah. level. But then it was for us, having something that is for both men and women has shows this kind of affinity to nature as well, a link to sleep, and is a... So not too gimmicky either. Mm -hmm. This was kind of our inspiration. Then we were aware that it could be difficult to pronounce yeah. and that that could be problematic. But on the other hand, you have so many weird names out there, right? So many. Hestens, Take Skype, yeah. another Swedish company. It's like yeah. nobody could pronounce yeah. Skype in the beginning, right? Yeah. Like, oh, how do you pronounce that? Yeah, or Fjellreven or whatever. Yeah. I mean, there's so many different strange yeah. names. And as we also were uh, focusing on the digital business, obviously on a digital, you just need to be able to click through. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. What we also realized when we started the company, so as, as I mentioned before, I started a company called Amorana and we were like really focused on can people pronounce it? And before we started with that company, it was called Love Box, like mm. take love and box, right? Mm. We, were just, we were just sending boxes with toys in it. And we thought like everybody can pronounce love and box and nobody could pronounce it. Everybody <laughs> was like Love Box because there's this band called Love Box and It was a complete mess. So I, I just realized in a digital world, it's more important that you have like this visual effect that people see it and recognize it. Mm. And you guys have this beautiful branding. I don't know how, and hopefully you can explain a bit more when we go into marketing, but I look at it and I recognize it immediately. Every time I look at it, I recognize it immediately. It has a similar font like the German news. It has a very similar font there and but every time I look at it, I recognize it and I realized for myself the pronunciation is not that important in a digital world anymore yeah no I think so so how did you guys start with the marketing what I read and what I heard is like you guys were very good in PR and right now I see you guys on you know dominating social media being on B2B uh, having your own pop-up stores But let's start in the beginning because this is a podcast that a lot of entrepreneurs listen. I always tell them that one of the best marketing strategies is PR. The problem with PR, is at one point, people won't talk about your story again and again because they heard it. But how did you guys approach PR? Was there like a systematic approach to it? For us in the very beginning, the, the biggest uh, support for us in PR was actually our collaboration with Uh, academic institutions in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So at the foundation, Dexman was two in a Swiss project, yeah. so federally funded projects, together with EMPA, which is the mm -hmm. you know uh, federal um, institution, and, yeah, yeah, for materials and yeah. and research, and then the Hochschule in Lucerne. So uh, let me dig into that very quickly. So you guys 
is it their technology or did you find it or how did that collaboration work exactly? In a Swiss is clear, you just mm. apply and then you get, you get the funds and you get the program. But how does that work with EMPA? The first project was about establishing physiological sleep needs and how we can meet those with what was closest to our skin. Through that research project, we found the different criteria to really look at and, and how, to, how to develop the, the technology. It is our IP that everything is based on. This was focusing on our first collection, which was the balance collection, which helps if you're hot and cold at night. Yeah. After that, we continued on with the stay warm and the stay cool collection. So we have three collections that are really focusing on thermoregulation. Mm -hmm. And how this then really helped us in terms of PR was actually that they sent out the press release. Obviously, yeah. this makes it much easier for media to pick it up. Yeah, than because if you it's neutral, are, right? Exactly. It's yeah. considered neutral. And that really, really helped us. So you guys invented the whole thing and then you went to EMPA and told them, hey, test that if it works or it doesn't, doesn't work. And then they said, hey, it works and we will make a release about it. Well, basically, we collaborated also on the yeah. establishing the sleep needs and really the impacting factors. Mm -hmm. um, everything is not just a, a fiber composition. It's also the construction technique, yeah. the weight. Um, also with uh, how SLO, we worked on, you know, how do you move during the night? So we mm -hmm. move actually on average almost 40 times every night mm -hmm. in small and larger movements. So based on that, where should the seams be placed, Where how, how to mm -hmm. construct the waistband and things like that. So yeah. all of that came in together yeah. into the research project yeah. and into the final result. And then both EMPA and HALSLO sent out press releases. Yeah. We also had a lot of support from Eastern Switzerland because actually Daxman is founded in St. Gallen. Ah, okay. Yeah. Because we were working yeah. with EMPA in yeah. St. Gallen yeah. uh, and we were also part of the start startup incubator there, Startfeld mm -hmm. in St. Gallen. Yeah. And Eastern Switzerland has a huge uh, history, actually, and legacy in terms of textiles. Yeah. So people were super... Valley sailing and yeah. stuff like that. It's huge textile. Yes. Right? So people were super excited about that. There were textile brought back into mm -hmm. Eastern Switzerland. So... We had a lot of support also from that, from media, but also from people who were very, very excited. Mm -hmm. And we got so much great. Um, the Easter Switzerland will always have a special place in our heart. Yeah. Even if we're now located in Zurich, it was just a big part of our first story. If I take like the bits out of that story, uh, I really believe thinking about PR, having local PR is often very helpful, which people underestimate at the beginning. They think they, we need to be in Blick or in... In, in some international newspapers, but if you start in like local newspapers, other newspapers will pick that up, right? So it's easier to get into a local one. You have like some connection to it. And the second thing that I also love about your story there is that you guys are, you had like a neutral partner putting out the release. It was not you guys telling them, hey, we have this great invention. And that's so much more helpful if you can have like this neutral approach to PR. I think it's different if you want to be like in the bilance or in the handel site and stuff like that. They want to talk to you. They want to talk about your business, your achievements. But if you want to be in mass media, they want to have like this neutral thing. They don't want to talk about you and your brand in the beginning, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, in the end, it's much more positive for a brand that they talk about the products than about you. Yeah. I mean, particularly in the beginning, when we were featured in a newspaper or on TV as well, we could see a direct jump in sales. Mm -hmm. And it's much more visible when it's related to our sleepwear than if it's about me as a person. Yeah. Yeah. So in that sense, I would always prefer to that they talk about Daxman rather than about me, yeah. in, uh, you know, because it's just having more of an impact. So you had this, this great boost in PR. How does your PR strategy look like now? Can you replicate that PR strategy like abroad? How do you do it like now in Switzerland? Well, how do you approach that? Because it seems like the basis of your product uh, marketing was PR getting the story out, right? How do you do it today? It is, as you were mentioning earlier, obviously, once the, a newspaper has written about you, they're not going to publish 10 more articles that, exactly. th that year. So for sure, it is getting more and more difficult to be featured. We are working now in Switzerland with our PR agency, mm -hmm. actually, that we started. PR kiosk, yeah. they're called. Yeah. With that, uh, we are getting featuring as well. We also do some sponsored articles yeah. and other collaborations yeah, like that. Yeah, I saw that. that. You, you did a lot on 20 Minutes. And, yeah. Uh, and yeah. We, we did that as well with Amanana. That, mm. that worked really nicely. Though. Yes, it, cool. it, yeah, exactly. It's actually working quite well. Yeah. Then internationally, we also had uh, PR agencies. We have a PR agency in the US. 
In the U.S., it's much easier to get in, actually. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the journalists, we focus very much on a sample basis. Yeah. So we send samples to any journalist. Yeah. And this yeah. is really, for us, what converts and what makes them write about yeah. us. We are featured in so many different, in the U.S., in everything from USA Today, Reader's Digest. Uh, we've been in the Times, yeah. you know. Which um, of these articles had, like, the biggest impact where you saw, like, was it St. Gala Talkblatt or was it the U.S. US it was St. Gala Talkblatt, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's the true. I mean, the the tricky part is outside of Switzerland, we never saw the same correlation between an article and Crazy, actual sales. Right? But also another part is we focus a lot on digital media. Yeah. For us, a digital featuring is always worth more than yeah. a printed feature. Because in print, they need to remember the name yeah, and yeah. then type it in on Google. And yeah. the other one is just you click it and yeah. then you're there, right? Yeah. So that was the PR part, which you guys did absolutely fabulous. Now we're talking. 2023, world has changed. People are more, they realize sleep is so important. There are a lot of sleep trackers, as I mentioned before, eight sleep, cooling down the bed, stuff like that. How does your marketing look like today? Where is your growth coming from? So we work with a very much a blended mix. Social media, which is one of us one, from the beginning, a very important channel for us, remains actually one of our biggest channels. But now, in our, if I look at our post-purchase survey, both in Switzerland and in Germany, 20% of people have heard of us through a personal recommendation from a uh-huh. friend. So this word of mer- word mouth to, to mouth, mouth, yeah. <laughs> word to mouth yeah. has really, really been uh, taking off for us yeah. in, in those two core markets. Yeah. So, and obviously, that is super, super positive because you're, nothing will be more credible than a person speaking from, to a friend on their own personal experience, yeah. right? This is... I think the most powerful marketing, if somebody tells you, hey, buy this. I remember, you know, friends of mine told me, hey, you want to improve your sleep, uh, do this and this and this. How do you, very strategically, how do you foster that? Because are you putting in like coupons for your friends in, in your packages? How do you foster that digitally? You know, because you cannot tell people to tell them, right? So how do you nudge them in that direction? We also have a referral program. Yeah. So uh, give give 20, get 20. Yeah. So if you refer a friend, you get a yeah. discount and, and the friend also gets a discount. Yeah. But what is a bit funny in some markets is that referral, like recommendation is a big source, yeah. but the referral program is not so popular. Yeah. And I think for some people, when, once there becomes a, a financial incentive, it feels maybe not so genuine or yeah, authentic exactly. anymore that they tell a friend. Yeah. And they might not care so much about you know, a 20 franc discount or exactly. whatever. So this we see working better in some markets and less mm-hmm. in others. So it is not so easy, actually, mm-hmm. to actively encourage it. Mm-hmm. We try to also always, you know, for example, around Christmas time, give the gift of sleep, mm-hmm. the gift we all need and want and, and things like that. And giftables, for sure, for us, is also a huge Mm-hmm. opportunity and uh, and a big source um, of new customers. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's it's something we've been thinking about as well, how to even mm-hmm. more actively encourage people yeah. to recommend. How do you guys do, you know, like content marketing? You know, it doesn't make sense to, to have like, these are five steps, how to improve your sleep and send that to your friends or something like that, or a video on TikTok, how to improve your sleep. Is that something that might work and, you know, refer that to a friend of yours or so? Yes, it could a- absolutely be as well. We, we try to have a combination also of holistic tips and advice mm-hmm. on our website. And we work with different kind of sleep experts mm-hmm. on that as well. We're now just launching here in, in Zurich, actually, a recovery masterclass focusing on, uh, on top athletes, um, athletic coaches yeah. and uh, physiotherapists on really how to um, use the power of sleep for, for athlete recovery. We work with a lot of athletes, actually. We're the official sponsor of the Swiss national ice hockey team. Really? Uh, who are oh. wearing our sleepwear. Oh. Uh, and we have uh, also a wide range of, you know, Ironman champions yeah. and, and Olympic medalists. A lot of people who are wearing our sleep because yeah. sleepwear because uh, for it's athlete, so important. athletes are really focusing on this yeah. now. I, I don't look like it, but I'm trying to get to the Olympics uh, in curling. <laughs> oh, so I'm in the curling national team for yeah. the Philippines. Oh, wow. Exciting. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, so I will check that out. I will yeah. check that out. Yeah. Another thing you guys did, which, which impressed me a lot. So we had like this COVID boost through online. And after that COVID boost online, 
I saw you guys open like the store in, in Seefeld and I see you guys more and more in large retail uh, stores. How did you approach that uh, specific approach, you know, to go offline? Was that something that you guys realized, okay, we need to build something like that offline, which probably also makes it a bit harder to go international, probably through B2B a little bit easier, but, you know, just opening shops everywhere, it's quite expensive, right? So how do you approach that? that offline growth? Actually, from the beginning, we always had the three pillars of entering any market. So it would be a physical presence, mm-hmm. a digital presence, and earned media. Mm-hmm. So we always try to focus on those three. Yeah. Um, now the physical presence has shifted. So when we started in Switzerland, um, we focus a lot on sleep shops. There are mm-hmm. so many shops out there selling beds and bed systems. Oh. And we were selling through them. And yeah. that was great for us because it helped us also position ourselves yeah. as different than from, from the Kalida or the regular yeah. apparel brand. Yeah, that makes a lot and of sense, And they are right? used to explaining products yeah. as well. Uh, now, as we're growing, you know, the traffic in those sleep shops are not high enough for, yeah. for it really to help us to scale and grow. You buy like one bed yes. every eight years. So exactly. it's like uh, for 15,000 francs, as exactly. you mentioned. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So with that, we really wanted to go into bigger, uh, bigger partners. Yeah. So that's why now at the moment in Switzerland, for example, I mean, we're in Globus, we're in Jamoli, we're in Lab, but we're also in, in health and wellness resorts mm-hmm. like Baba Guts, for example. Uh, we're in Baldona and we are in also many smaller shops, mm-hmm. actually. Yeah. Obviously, when you're starting out, it's very, very difficult to get into the big yeah. shops as yeah. well. So this is also, it's not always a question of do you, if we want to be in or not, if yeah. it's, are they going to take us in or yeah. not? Yeah. So that's where SR brand grew from the kind of grassroots. It's, it's yes. changing, right? Yes. Now they want you. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's definitely a big shift. You guys are in, you sold items in over 100 countries. So my first thought was like, okay, that's really complicated. Because when we started the company, we were only in Switzerland and we tried abroad and that was a big mess. And then I, I read that like over 100 co- uh, countries and I was like, I need to ask you, how do you guys set that up? Is it something like you tried in over 100 countries and now you're pulling back again and focusing on core markets? Or is it like, okay, no, this strategy works uh, worldwide. We are from day one worldwide. Or is it like, a, as I mentioned before, like a, a, a regional thing? And how is the set up to go international? Because that's really impressive. We decided from the get-go to be worldwide because yeah. we always felt like there is, we are a niche company in some ways. In some ways, we're a mass company because everyone sleeps, everyone right? Sleeps, right? But on the other hand, it's not everyone who wants to really invest in their sleep and, and look for solutions. So we thought, okay, maybe it's more of a niche, but it's a global niche and it's a growing uh, segment of the market. And when you are starting digital, you can be global from day one. Mm-hmm. Obviously, shipping out of Switzerland exactly. is difficult. That's so a, we, that's a yeah. hassle, right? Yes, so we actually, from the beginning, had two warehouses. Mm-hmm. We had one in Switzerland, Switzerland and one outside of Switzerland in the EU space. Yeah. At the moment, we have actually one warehouse now. We, oh. we merged again last year. In EU? Yes. And then send it yes. into Switzerland, like yes. Zalando and all the yes. other ones. Yes. Uh, yeah. This is a big help for us because we have so many SKUs. Yeah. So it helped us to almost half our inventory, actually, yeah. because you never had the right products in the right yeah. warehouse. We had to sh- ship between the warehouses and so forth. It was just quite a complication. And, you know, like sending, so you have like EU, I get that. But how do you send to the US? Is it easy today from Germany to send to the US? It is very easy. Uh, of course, it's more expensive, yeah. but it is very easy. And we actually ship within two business days to the U.S. So we have many U.S. customers saying to us, hey, you know, it, it, it arrives quicker than if I'm yeah. ordering from the East Coast that I live on the West Coast, for Crazy. example. So that's actually not a problem. Yeah. But in reality, we focus on some core markets, yeah. but we distribute worldwide. Yeah. And the core markets for us are Switzerland, Germany, the U.S., and the U.K. Yeah. After Brexit, the UK has gone down a little bit, but those are a core core. And then if we is expect- it harder to send to the UK yes, now? Yes, it is. But you still do it from the warehouse. Yes, yeah, we still but do it's it. Harder. It's harder and it's more expensive because yeah. you have to have so many different documentations. Yeah. Uh, so it's just a little bit more tricky. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of the customers in the UK got a bit burned after yeah. Brexit because they ordered goods and then had to pay customs fees. Customs and, yeah. 
and, and all of that. So that, that became a little bit more tricky. So is it more expensive for you or for the customer? So we carry the cost. Yeah. So if they place an order about above 150, we, yeah. we pay for the, yeah. for the shipping. And we also have free returns. So in that sense, it is more expensive for us which we then compensated by increasing the prices for the UK a bit and things like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, because that, I, I believe that's, there are very few brands who can handle like a global uh, distribution. And I saw it myself. Uh, we had something like 18,000 SKUs. It was a nightmare. And seeing companies uh, who do that, you know, owning their brand, obviously we were a bit different because we had like multi-brand. You have single brand and uh, seeing that, that that is possible, sending to the U.S. in two days, it's fascinating for me. And I need to think about that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's jump a little bit towards the end, your sleep routine, because as mentioned before, beginning of this year, I, I was massively overweight. I, I was snoring uh, and I decided to go to the Olympics. Uh, that was my plan or is still my plan. And now I'm like, okay, optimizing everything. And I realized, okay, with all these life hackers around and, and optimization junkies, sleep is like the new religion. It's like number one, you can improve everything else, but everybody starts with sleep. So you're in this absolute beautiful niche. What is your personal sleep routine? How does it look like? Uh, you are thinking about sleep a lot. So I, I want to piggyback on your, on your experience in, uh, directly. I think what's helpful is to use a tracker in the beginning to really see what makes an impact on your own sleep quality, because I think it's also very personal. I think Aura, the Aura ring is, yeah. is quite efficient, actually. Yeah. I don't then wear it daily because yeah. or nightly because uh, I find it a bit irritating when I get a bad score. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was stressing me out. I had Aura, I had Whoop, I had all of these. And I was like, oh, okay, I need to get rid of these. I think it's enough to wear it long yeah. enough that you understand yeah. what really impacts your yeah. sleep. So for me, for sure, it is temperature. I always try to have a very cold room because breathing in cold air helps to lower the core temperature. Mm -hmm. And then you can layer on. So open the windows. Yes, all, all year around open window. Through the night? Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, and do you do like a friend of mine recommended to me, like get a hot shower in the evening because that drops your temperature yes. as well. Yes. This is another uh, hot shower or hot bath before yeah. going to bed. Then your, your, your temperature will afterwards drop more quickly yeah. and it will make you sleepy. So this will help you to fall asleep, not to stay asleep yeah. necessarily. But there are also other tricks like that. For example, if your hands and feet are cold, for example, mm -hmm. we cannot actually, it's very difficult to fall asleep because it signals to the body that you're kind of freezing. You are so dying. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't so it's, sleep, exactly, you're dying. Exactly, exactly. Don't fall asleep in this, you know, snow yeah. pile or whatever. Yeah. Um, so by warming up our hands and feet, we do you have of, gloves? We don't have gloves, but we have actually socks, sleep yeah, socks, yeah. that are also helping them not to overheat during yeah. the night. So I think temperature, obviously, wear, yeah. wear the right sleepwear, the right bedding, have a comfortable bed, understand what means comfortable to you. Also, when it comes to, to pillows, uh, for me, what's super important also is do you food. have a thick or, or a thin pillow? I have a super thin pillow. Yeah, that's also what I uh, I was in massage recently, and that guy was like, most uh, back problems are because people lie on, on mm. two thick pillows. So I exchange that a super thin pillow yeah. and I only sleep on the back. How do you sleep there? Yes, I also sleep on the back actually. Yeah. Yeah. Do you tape your mouth? No. Uh, mm. I do that. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure if that helps uh, at all, mm. but I, I no. start taping. Yeah. So what else do you do? So for me, uh, what I realized apart from that is very, very important is is food and obviously also alcohol. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I love a glass of wine, but let's yeah. let's be honest that Drinking alcohol does lower your sleep quality. Massively, um, massively. Yes. People don't realize. Yeah. You think you sleep good after a glass of wine or two. Mm. If you look at your aura ring, it's awful. Yeah. So I try to just be mindful. I'm, I'm still drinking wine, but mm -hmm. I'm definitely more mindful. I also, food has a big impact mm -hmm. on me. So I try. What do you eat in the evening? I try to eat very light in the yeah. evening because otherwise the metabolism, your stomach is working the whole night. But and not salads, I heard. Like salads shouldn't be eaten in the evening, right? Yeah, I mean, it depends. On, I think it's a personal okay. thing. Some people say chicken is not good. So, yeah. I, mean, I don't know. Yeah. I think it's more to not have like very heavy food, yeah. like ro like uh, red meats or you know deep fried or so, or even just not eating too much. Yeah. Actually, yeah. then for some people, obviously, caffeine is is a big factor for me. It doesn't matter. I can yeah. drink a, a, yeah. an espresso at ten o'clock, and yeah. it doesn't impact me at yeah. all. 
then in general, it's, it's general things like uh, exercise, for example. Don't do sports too late because then you can be a bit overhyped and also uh, yeah. too hot to fall yeah. asleep. But still, obviously, exercise is super important. During the winter, I think it's also important to go outside during the day because and to expose ourselves to natural daylight yeah. because otherwise our our sleep-wake rhythm can get kind of out of whack because we don't see uh, any natural light. Yeah, and obviously also phones, right? In yes. The, because what I read recently is that when the sun is going down and it gets dark, we get a boost of being a bit more awake because we needed that small boost because when it became dark, we needed some more energy to get home because it was like, okay, we are not at home. We need some energy mm -hmm. to get home and then we can fall asleep. So you have like this small boost and then it goes mm -hmm. down. And, and if you are looking at the phone, you, you, you can't sleep and you get this boost first and then mm -hmm. your, your sleep's complete. Mm -hmm. So do you have your, like your phone in your, in your bedroom or is it like outside? Uh, Sorry for being so specific, but I'm a yeah, sleep absolutely. junkie. I mean, also for the kind of, uh, many people recommend to not have the phone in the bedroom mm -hmm. for the light, but also for the radiation and things yeah. like that. But uh, but I actually do have it, yeah. I must admit. So yeah. I think it's about finding for yourself what is the level that works for yeah. you and what are the main levers that, that are important for you. Uh, I think that's more important than trying to optimize every aspect because you can also become a bit obsessive about it. Uh, and one thing <laughs> that really helps, but one people that really prevent thing that really prevents people from sleeping well is actually stress. Yeah, exactly. So if you're really stressing yourself out also about sleeping well, Just taping your then, mouth and everything, <laughs> then like... obviously you're not going to sleep so yeah. well. So also it's 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 so interesting. I think it's it's such a you know the mental health or yeah. well being, a physical well being, everything is so tied in together. Uh, and uh, really uh, all focusing uh, on the sleep as well. And let's talk about now about your products because, you know, after after this interview this afternoon, I will go into the shop and buy this. I, I didn't want to buy it before. I want to buy it before to impress you. But then I realized, no, I want to ask you first what I need to buy. I'm a typical person. I would say, you know, probably hear a lot of them. I probably feel a bit too warm. I don't feel that cold when it it's probably a bit too warm and I don't know exactly what to buy. So usually I have like a merino shirt and underwear. I go to bed and have like my, my normal blanket and, and pillow. But what would you recommend for, for me? What should I buy? Also with the aspect of I travel a lot and I don't want to bring too much things. So what should I buy? If you just want to go for one, it is the balance collection. So this is ideal all year around. Mm -hmm. And it's ideal if you're hot and cold at night. So yeah. six times more breathable than cotton and four times better at moisture management. So it really works both with mm -hmm. evaporative cooling and also moisture wicking to make sure if you do get hot, that, that kind of heat is used to help you to cool down without becoming wet, yeah. actually. So this is really, really great for that purpose. Then during the summer, our Stay Cool collection which is eight times more breathable than cotton, is, is extremely popular. Mm -hmm. And during the winter season, our Stay Warm collection with merino wool is giving that kind of, because it's a mix of merino wool and also eucalyptus fibers, it gives that lightweight warm. So like I need to buy all three of them. <laughs> well, right now, maybe start with balance. That yeah. would be good. But also when you go to the Olympics, you could try our recovery collection. So yeah. this is actually using a mineral pr print. Yeah. And this mineral print reflects back infrared energy that our body yeah. naturally yeah. emits, yeah. which helps to oxygenate the muscles yeah. to, to recovery. improve recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Infrared is great for mm. recovery, right? Yeah. Um, and is it like the pants and the shirt? Or, or do you have like, w what would you recommend there? Because I never had like pants, um, like this guy, t-shirt and, and underwear. You know, and I'm not sure if I would feel very comfortable in the beginning to, to wear these, you know, like, okay, there's something on my leg. How, what would you recommend there? So we have a complete mix and match uh, yeah. setup. So you can choose a long sleeve with shorts. We also have sleep underwear, for example, if you prefer a boxer or a briefs. Yeah. Um, so it's really a personal preference, yeah. what, what works best for you. And last question, as a, as a male, how often do I need to wash it? It depends entirely on uh, how much you sweat, I yeah. would say, basically. But what's the benefit of our, uh, you know, super fine natural fibers is that you don't have to wash it so often. You mm -hmm. can also just hanging it out to, to, to air instead. Yeah. In general, from a sustainability perspective, people wash their clothes way too much. Yeah. Way, way, way yeah. too much. 
Uh, and if you want your clothes to last, you don't need to wash them as as. So as what well. would you recommend? Just in, what do you guys recommend? Like once a week, twice a week? Whoa. I mean, one once a week, I would say definitely yeah. is enough. Um, unless of course you're, yeah, you know, sweating. yeah, yeah. That was very helpful, uh, and I'm super looking forward to go to the to the store and and buy the stuff afterwards. Uh, I have some finishing questions. Um, just you know, as mentioned before, there are a lot of entrepreneurs listening, and so. My first question, or one of the last questions, first question here is, what are like the, the books you like to read about entrepreneurship and what helped you in the process? Even more than reading books, what really helped us in the process actually was reaching out to entrepreneurs. And one thing that I found so inspirational in the beginning was just how many people that are so willing to talk to you and give advice mm -hmm. um, on big questions, small questions, use your network, pe friends of friends. But also, for example, when we launched our, our Kickstarter, we were about to launch our Kickstarter campaign. Mm -hmm. So we looked up the three most successful Kickstarter campaigns mm -hmm. out of Switzerland mm -hmm. um, that are, were in a similar kind of category. Mm -hmm. I sent just a general email to their like info at yeah. email saying, hey, we're also launching a campaign. I saw yours. I was really impressed. Do you have time to talk? Two out of those replied within one hour. Yeah. And I had several calls with them and they gave me yeah. access to the network, gave us so much valuable input and advice. And if I compare that to the hours I spent reading online articles yeah. and, you know, I think hearing it from a person can really, really be beneficial. Yeah. And it's, that would be my advice to not be shy. People yeah. in general are happy to share yeah. and to give, give advice. You can really uh, learn so much from that. I think that's a great uh, word to finish that podcast go out and talk to people and and seek advice and uh, don't be afraid to try things right exactly perfect thank you very much for taking time and uh, i will grab the stuff this afternoon and we will let you know how i sleep very good looking forward thank you so much perfect <laughs> <laughs>